Danny Heifog is a social activist, writer, and political analyst, analyst who works have appeared in such publication as Midprint News, Counterpunch, and the American Herald Tribune for the last five years. He has also been a weekly contributor to the Black Agenda Report. Please welcome Danny Heifog. Hi, Danny. Hey, Jimmy. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to bring you on because you know about this. So I'm going to talk about, so, so Nancy Pelosi went to, to Taiwan. And the Chinese people did not like, the government did not like that. They delivered a stern warning to U.S. officials about House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, her possible visit to Taiwan, a foreign ministry spokesman said on Monday, confirming a report by the Financial Times. The Financial Times report published on Saturday cited six people familiar with the Chinese warnings as saying they were significantly stronger than the threats that Beijing had made in the past when it was unhappy with the United States actions or policy on Taiwan. Which is claimed by China. The private rhetoric suggests a possible military response. Wow. Uh, they cited several people familiar with the situation. So the Pentagon, this is from the Ins Business Insider, says Pentagon is prepared to protect Pelosi with fighter jets <laughs> and ships if she visits Taiwan after China warned her not to. Can you effing believe this? This was from four hours ago, and that was now probably six hours ago. So why do I bring all this up? Well, because it's important. It's says starting a war with uh, nuclear power. Ro Khanna, friend of the show and fake progressive politician, says, who are they to say that Speaker Pelosi shouldn't go to Taiwan? The Chinese Communist Party doesn't get to dictate the travel schedule of the Speaker of the House. Okay, you want to hear him say it? Here we go. On a different issue, Congress, have you, uh, President Biden has said the U.S. military believes a Taiwan visit by the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi uh, is, quote, not a good idea right now. You sit on the Armed Services Committee. Should she call off this possible trip to Taiwan? No, she should not. I respect Speaker Pelosi. I mean, we're not going to let the Chinese Communist Party dictate where the Speaker of the House should go. Uh, Taiwan is a economic partner with us. That doesn't mean that her going there is somehow not recognizing the one China policy. She should absolutely go. And we need to speak out uh, on human rights issues in China. And we need to speak out about the trade deficit in China. So I fully support her going. But is it worth potentially, God forbid, provoking some sort of military response from the Chinese? Yes. They should realize that that would be the worst thing they could do. I mean, they've seen this president, our country's resolve uh, in Ukraine uh, with rallying NATO. They've seen the sanctions on Russia. I mean, they would cripple their entire economy. They are so dependent on the United States ha! in terms of uh, the trade that we have. So we shouldn't allow them to bluff and ha -ha! dictate to America, the greatest nation in the world. He said, don't let China, that nuclear power, bluff about threatening us ah. with military. Let's let's call their bluff. Let's start a war. Is what Ro Khanna just said, in case you were following along at home, he just said, let's call their bluff, the Chinese nuclear power, and let's start a war. First speaker of the House should travel. I mean, who are they to say that Speaker Pelosi shouldn't go to Taiwan? Congressman Ro Khanna, thanks as usual for joining so let me bring in uh, Danny Haifong. Danny, what, what would you like to say about this? There's so much to say, Jimmy. First, when Ro Khanna says, who are they to say? Well, uh, China is the, uh, the People's Republic of China is the rightful government that sits at the United Nations. And the United States itself has signed three joint communiques, has agreed to a one China principle that the United Nations follows. So it seems like that China kind of has the right to say, uh, which political official decides to go. But one thing that Ro Khanna is doing here is he's minimizing the fact that Nancy Pelosi is the third in command in Washington. If Joe Biden and Kamala Harris cannot uh, be president of the United States for some reason, Nancy Pelosi assumes that role. And so for Nancy Pelosi to just travel to Taiwan when there is all sorts of tensions around uh, so-called independence, and separatism, the U.S. sending arms to Taiwan, billions upon billions upon tens of billions of dollars. There's a backlog of $14 billion alone since the Trump administration. We, there's already been five arms sales deals 
that have occurred under Joe Biden to Taiwan. With all of these tensions, the third in command in D.C. going to Taiwan, talking to officials there independently of the People's Republic, seems to me with warships, with uh, uh, military aircraft coming in, seems to me like a pretty big provocation toward China, which China has said it will respond today. Xi Jinping said to Joe Biden today in a phone call that if you play with fire over the one China policy, you're going to get burned. You are going to get burned because this is about sovereignty. This is about the fact that the United States and Nancy Pelosi being so arrogant, having so much hubris that she believes that she can go over the Pentagon, over Joe Biden himself. And Ro Khanna here is just doesn't know anything. He's he's this is just stupidity to say that the sanctions on Russia and unifying NATO has worked. It has not worked. The United States is in an economic catastrophe. Europe is going toward a very cold and hard winter coming up because of the sanctions on Russia. That is not going to work with China, which is by far more important to the U.S. economy than even Russia and to Europe's economy as well. So to, to try to saber rattle around this idea that it's going to hurt China more uh, uh, to uh, defend its sovereignty is absolutely ridiculous. This shows that Ro Khanna actually doesn't know anything about foreign policy. And we also have to bring up that his wife, uh, uh, Ritu Khanna, she is a, has hundreds of thousands of dollars. His wife has stocks in... in, in Defense mil contractors, military contractors, Raytheon, Honeywell, Boeing. She is a major investor. And so given the fact that the U.S. Uh, seemingly... Uh, many times per quarter, it gives Taiwan uh, major arms deals, Biden five times in over a year and a half now. It seems that Ro Khanna is going along with this because it's it's both profitable and he is kiss he is kissing the feet of Mama Bear again, kissing the feet of Mama Bear. He said in the beginning of this interview, I respect, I respect Speaker Pelosi. Yes. Wolf Blitzer wasn't even asking him to I criticize know. Nancy Pelosi. He wasn't asking to criticize. He's just saying, don't you think it's it might be bad? Joe Biden is saying it might be a poor taste. It might cause problems. What do you think about that? He's not saying go criticize Nancy Pelosi, but yet he felt the need to say to, to uh, he respects it respects Speaker Pelosi. Speaker Pelosi. What the yeah. f? Well, here's what some other people have to say about it. Caitlin Johnstone says the progressive Democrat is a myth. That's because of what. I mean, he's 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 saber rattling like the biggest warmonger in the world. That's what Joe Biden. I mean, that's what uh, Ro Khanna was doing. Here's what Michael Tracy says. He says if a politician or pundit makes a point to theatrically say Chinese Communist Party instead of Chinese government or China, it's because they're trying to stoke antagonistic passions in service of whatever confrontational policy they're trying to advocate. I didn't notice Ro did that, but I guess he did. Hey, dummy, nobody voted for you knuckleheads to start a conflict with China. That's in response to Rokana. Rokana would be the dummy. Yeah. I say this as someone who's genuinely rooting for you, but what the F is your problem? <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I mean, I was genuinely rooting for Rokana until the CARES Act. All of them, Bernie Sanders, Rokana, the squad, the CARES Act, that was that. It was over. Um, Go here's Meet the Press. You want to see what Meet the Press does? This is the kind of stuff they do, Danny. Welcome back. In our final episode of this season's Meet the Press reports, we put together a remarkable war game simulation of how the U.S. might react if China invaded Taiwan. The National Security Think Tank Center for a New American Security, or CNAS, convened two teams. The blue team representing the United States and the red team representing China. Which side would prevail? Would China attack the U.S. mainland? Could nuclear war break out? The conflict takes place in 2027. There are three rounds of strategy. And I spoke to the game master after each round to see where the conflict stood. Here's a look. This is just good uh, Sunday afternoon TV. Hey, <laughs> let, let's fantasize about a nuclear war. Huh? How, does it, how did it turn out? How did that nuclear war turn out? That's... Because they're sponsored by the military industrial complex. That's why they do that. More wars, more way more money. Go ahead, Danny. You wanna you wanna say anything about that? 
Well, the Center for New American Security has become a lucrative a slush fund a think tank for exactly as you said, the military industrial complex. Uh, Northrop Grumman Systems Corporation gives five hundred thousand plus dollars to this think tank, and the U.S. Department of Defense is also the uh, biggest funder of this think tank. So this think tank is literally peddling, not soft peddling. This is just hard peddling war with China, preparing the population. And we know who watches NBC. We know that it is uh, mainly the electorate, right? So preparing the electorate, those who are going to vote Democrat to support a war, a nuclear war uh, with China, because there is no other war that could happen with China. There is no other one. All this military encirclement, any kind of provocation that would happen at uh, the United States, uh, this, this is a, a war without victory, just like the war, the proxy war with Russia is a war without victory. The United States and NATO, they're never going to come out of that with any kind of semblance of their objectives, right? The only thing that could happen is a major confrontation, a major confrontation that nobody wants. China doesn't want it. Uh, all the world doesn't want it. And certainly, uh, if the vast majority of the population were to understand the circumstances beyond the anti-China rhetoric that we hear from the media and uh, the political class, uh, they also would not want uh, to become nuclear ju dust just because uh, weapons contractors want to make profits and just because uh, the Pentagon wants to meet this uh, ridiculous objective of trying to contain and overthrow China. I mean, there, there is Ro Khanna pretending to be a progressive politician and anti-war, and there he is bragging about how well the Ukraine war is going after he voted to give him $54 billion. So Ro Khanna's on board with the Ukraine war, which is a bullshit war. And he used that to justify, look what we did to that, look how good it's going over there. It's going horribly. And he says, let's do it. Let's let's call their bluff huh. in China. So I don't care whatever Ro Khanna did on Yemen is now completely wiped away because now he's trying to start. He's up for starting a nuclear war, not with just one nuclear power, but two. And that's because Ro Khanna is, is, uh, he is ambitious politically and he wants to be president. And he knows he's not going to do it outside the Democratic Party or outside the real donor class, which really controls shit, which is why he's now kissing the ass of Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden. That's what he's doing. And that's why he's giving her respect. And that's why he's voting for their wars. And that's why he's supporting her going to Taiwan and trying to start a third world war. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, and so that would make him a transparent charlatan, pro-war climber who's only interested in his own career. And that's what Rokana is. Um, I got no trouble saying that. I'd say it to his face any day of the week. That guy is a fucking scammer. Uh, anything you'd like to add to that? I mean, I was how slack jawed were you when you saw Rokana not only go along with this, but Ukraine too? It's just nuts. All of this was done in a short segment. This is just a couple of minutes on, on with Wolf Blitzer, uh, literally just peddling the <laughs> Pentagon line on Russia and China. And it's, it, I mean, for me, I was, I wasn't surprised that he held these positions. I was surprised that he didn't understand at all the significance, the history, and, and the impact of what uh, this trip represents, what this potential trip could represent. Because he obviously hasn't done any research on what the one China policy is, he hasn't done any research on how significant this policy is to US China relations. He hasn't done any research on the fact that the United States has been militarizing the island of Taiwan as well as the entire region for years upon years upon years. He doesn't seem to care about that. What he cares about is scoring points, as you said, with his fellow Democrats and what Nancy Pelosi is doing. Uh, this is my theory about this. The reason why she's doing this, she's done this before, even to China in the early 90s. She went to China in 1991. And this is just three years after Tiananmen Square incident. She went there. She got the CNN bureau chief arrested. He was arrested. He was he was semi detained. Right. The police uh, uh, apprehended him because Nancy Pelosi went off the beaten path and decided to put flowers on Tiananmen Square to to celebrate the incident uh, in a very sensitive time. Uh, uh, and so she's done this before. It's all dr drama. It's all gestures. And it's all to win over, not Democratic Party voters, not the left. It's to win over people like Mike Pompeo and Newt Greenrich. 
That's who was singing Nancy Pelosi's praises over this potential trip. That's what she was doing in the early 90s with China. That's what she's doing now because the election is coming up and the Democratic Party strategy isn't to satisfy the constituents. It isn't to try to win them over. It's to win over all of the establishment forces, the corporate forces, the big tent that Hillary Clinton wanted in 2016 and got and lost. She is trying to do this again with Taiwan, a tough on China stance, right? We're tough on China. It doesn't matter that going this tough means you could end up in a military uh, situation that uh, the United States cannot handle and really the world cannot handle, right? So that, I think, is the stakes. And Ro Khanna doesn't understand that, which means that should frighten us, but also should show us that it doesn't matter uh, how progressive you are. If you're for Medicare for all and nuclear war for all, you're not a progressive. Yeah, I can't, Yeah, I, I would say so. I would say so. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so tell tell people what the one China policy is. Sure. So the United States began uh, the the infamous Nixon uh, uh, delegation where uh, the United States and China began the normalization process, the famous meeting, Nixon, Kissinger, go to China, meet with Mao, meet with Zhou Enlai. And they began the process of normalizing relations because for 22 years beforehand, since 1949, the United States had a blockade on China. They prevented China from uh, entering the United Nations, and they also had an econo economic sanctions on China. So the normalization process begins, and Taiwan is a huge question because the history of Taiwan at that time was the former government, what was called the Republic of China, founded in 1911. They went into exile after the Civil War. So there was a long Civil War. There was a lot of betrayal of the KMT. Uh, toward the People's Liberation Army. They worked together against Japan for a little bit, but they had fundamental differences. One wanted uh, to build a, a capitalist system in China, fully capitalist, fully uh, 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 ingratiated with Western economies, and, China, and the People's Liberation Army wanted socialism. So they, were, they exiled themselves to what was called Formosa at the time. That's what Taiwan was called. And uh, 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 they ruled the island. Uh, as the Republic of China. So the idea is with One China is that, well, there are different understandings of how China should be governed. During this normalization process, there are multiple communiques, multiple agreements between the US and China that said, okay, the Republic of China in Taiwan believes that it's the rightful government, but the United Nations doesn't believe so. So we recognize the People's Republic of China as the rightful government of China, and that there is one China that includes just two different uh, ideas of how it should be governed. But that's not the United States to determine or to interfere with. However, the U.S. decided in 1979 to pass the Taiwan Relations Act, which said we can give arms to Taiwan whenever we want in order to, quote unquote, defend the island from China, from the mainland, from the People's Republic of China. And that was the loophole. So the one China policy has been respected in word and frequently violated indeed, although every presidential administration, including Joe Biden's, will say, we respect this policy, because to not is a, is a war provocation. These were agreements about normalization, and to, uh, 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 and to violate it means you're cutting off diplomatic ties and moving into conflict. And so the United States under Trump really escalated the idea of Taiwan as an independent country, a very new idea. Continue the policy of arming Taiwan uh, to an even greater extent now than Donald Trump. And uh, he has said on three different occasions that the United States is prepared to militarily intervene in Taiwan should China, quote unquote, invade. The problem with that formulation is that China has said we are for peaceful reunification uh, uh, as long as there is no move by a foreign power like the United States to interfere and try to sever Taiwan from China. So the one China policy is the policy that stipulates and that the United Nations recognizes, the United States says it recognizes, and China has been following uh, uh, to uh, deal with the fact that you have two different systems in one country. Um, it's to, you could think of it as an even more uh, complicated situation than like Hong Kong. One country, two systems, uh, Taiwan has had a government that believes that it is the rightful government of all of China. And only just recently, over the past five to ten years, has there been this move 
among certain political factions that the U.S. supports in Taiwan that says, no, 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 we don't we want to be an independent country as Taiwan. And that is backed with as well as constant political interference by the United States. So. um so this is just a political stunt to distract during the midterms? Is that what this is? Is that what you're saying that Nancy Pelosi is doing? That's what it feels like. That's what it feels like if we use our rational brains. Now, for our irrash- for the irrational brains of the political and military establishment of the United States, I am sure, I mean, there are forces, right, that want to see this come to a head, that want to see a conflict. They wouldn't be arming Taiwan like this, uh, the military contractors, You wouldn't have so many folks in the GOP and even in the Democratic Party. I mean, Ro Khanna, right? There are people who want to see a conflict, obviously, because they are conducting a policy of military encirclement. Because it's not just Taiwan. It's the entire Asia Pacific. Taiwan is just the most extreme example because Taiwan is legally part of China. So uh, if we think about this, I mean, I, I like to use the comparison of what a foreign minister, Chinese foreign minister, uh, Wang Yi decided to go to Texas, where there is uh, somewhat of a secessionist movement, right? Texas should be an independent uh, country. Or California, even, where you have the more liberal type. What if Wang Yi went there and said, okay, uh, we're going to give you arms and you're going to separate? What would happen, right? Yeah. There would be a war in an instant. China has been very patient with a process that the United States has not been a good faith actor in because the 1982 joint communique, the third one, that was signed by the United States says the United States is to reduce its arms sales and it is to come to a final resolution over this and not sell more arms to Taiwan than it had the previous year. A fancy way of saying every single year you are reducing arms sales until they are zero. And then the United States in 1979 said, oh, well, uh, we have this act and the United States has respected the Taiwan Relations Act way more than it has respected this joint communique. So the U.S. has been playing uh, uh, games with diplomacy in order to try to uh, build up toward a war with China that, again, seems like Ro Khanna, Nancy Pelosi, not only do they not understand the significance of this and what it really means, but they seem to be itching for a conflict, for something that yeah. will help them electorally in the midterms because they won't offer anything to the working class. That's right. R- Ro Khanna and Nancy Pelosi ju- have just spent two years letting you down, uh, not not giving you health care, not giving you a living wage, a $15 minimum wage, not giving you student debt relief, not t- not getting a marijuana uh, legal, nothing. Nothing. And so that's why Ro Khanna's like, hey, let's go pick a fight with China and start, start a nuclear war. They better they better be smart and let us call their bluff. I bet they're bluffing. That's what Ro Khanna's saying right now on national TV. I bet they're bluffing about a war. Let's just go do it. What a fucking, wow, what an asshole. Come see our stand-up comedy. We'll be in Los Angeles, Bakersfield, Indianapolis, Louisville, Cincinnati, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Detroit, lots more. Go to jimmydorkcomedy.com for a link for all our tickets. <laughs>